Shareholder activism is a big topic, so we're going to cover it very briefly, and we're going to focus on a couple key rules in shareholder activism that are relevant to this general study of shareholder rights as they relate to the corporation as a formal choice. And so we're going to talk about some of the problems with shareholder activism and why shareholders don't act, and those economic reasons are called collective action problems. We talked a little bit about them last week. We're going to go over them a little bit more this week and talk about how they may have changed because of change in circumstances. The other thing that has changed circumstantially is the rise of the class of institutional investors. So right after World War II, the investors were primarily ordinary people who were investing you know, their life savings or what have you, some portion of that. Uh, that has totally changed, and now the landscape is almost entirely dominated by large corporations that manage money for other people, and these institutional investors have a different set of economic problems. The collective action problems don't apply as much to them. I've also argued in some of my writing that social media is another factor which is changing the way shareholders act and cause management to act, and so we'll talk briefly about that. The main way that shareholders create uh, uh, changes in management is by having a proxy contest. And this is a kind of battle for a corporate control, also known as a proxy battle uh, in that context. And the way that a proxy contest proceeds is each side will solicit from the shareholders a vote, a voting card. And this is called a proxy solicitation. And so we're now going to get past the theory and into some very clear rules as the SEC has some rules about when you can and cannot and how you can and cannot solicit these proxies from other shareholders in order to try to win this contest for corporate control. One particular area we'll look at is newspaper advertisements. This is the Lilco case. We're going to see how newspaper advertisement can be a proxy solicitation. And then we're also going to talk very briefly in that same breath, so to speak, as well uh, about tweets and whether Twitter and tweets and new media, new social media, might also be construed as a, uh, a public statement that might also be governed by the securities laws. And the short answer is it doesn't seem to be yet, but maybe that needs to change. The last rule that we're uh, going to pertain to, last two rules we're going to look at pertain to whether or not the winners can get reimbursed. And that does change the dynamics a little bit. Uh, we have the, uh, something called the reimbursement rule. And then finally, we're going to look at shareholder proposals for things other than voting. And we're going to look at a couple specific examples because shareholders can make what are called precatory proposals. These are recommendations. They're non-binding, but they make a policy statement about what the corporation should do, how it should behave relates to corporate social responsibility in some important ways, does take power away from management by suggesting the shareholders should direct how the corporation shall be governed, how it shall be run, and what it shall do. And so we're going to talk about those as well. So I'll begin by reiterating some of the themes about collective action problems. And there are three main collective action problems that are worth remembering that we discussed last week but are worth reiterating here. The first is the problem of rational apathy. Apathy is what it sounds like. Apathy is being uninterested in doing something. But rational apathy is a particular economic approach where we understand that a person has a good reason for not taking an action, mainly because taking an action would not pay off. Or let's say the combination of the cost of taking that action and the probability of a better result does not add up to it being worthwhile to spend the time and effort on that action. Now, of course, this is predicated on the idea that people are rational and people behave rationally. Much of economics, aside from behavioral economics, does have that basis, does have that baseline assumption. You may or may not agree with the assumption, but at least in the aggregate, it seems to be true that in the aggregate, people do not take action where they feel it won't be worth their while. And that's sort of a general principle here. So rational apathy applies in this case where the cost to a shareholder of acquiring information about a company times the probability of improving the value of that company or their own value through that knowledge does not equal, is less than, the amount of cost that they would incur to get that information, whether that is buying information or whether that is spending time digging it out. Question? Can you just repeat that? Yeah, 
the, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of making up on the spot, so you have to get the video to get the verbatim response. But the, the, uh, essentially, the uh, amount of effort that is required to make a decision times the expected value of that decision. So I'll give you a more concrete example instead of just giving you the words. But let's say you have a stock that's worth $100. And if management does poorly and makes a bad choice, that stock could fall 20% in value. And so you want to find out if management is at risk of making this bad choice. So how much is it worthwhile to you? Well, at most, the stock will lose, uh, well, first off, at most, the stock will lose all its value. You can't do worse than losing all your money. But you're only expecting the stock to lose 20% of value if, in fact, management makes a bad decision, or a decision which you don't agree with you think will be bad for value. There's also some risk inherent with that. You don't really know whether that's going to happen. But it costs you some amount of effort to figure out what decision management is going to make. You might have to tune in to an investor call, or you might have to purchase a copy of The Economist, or even just go on your iPhone and read The Wall Street Journal for a couple hours and try to figure out various macroeconomic trends. All of those activities represent a cost to you, the shareholder. And you're not going to incur those costs unless it's worthwhile, unless your expected value from incurring those costs is more than the cost that you expect to incur. So the equation, again, such as it is, is a person will only spend effort when the cost of spending that effort is less than the expected return from that effort, which is the combination of the value times the probability of it happening. And so this is a concept called rational apathy when that value is actually greater in terms of, sorry, the cost is greater than the expected value, in which case it makes sense not to take any action. So let's say you earn $20 an hour in your job and it would take you an hour and a half to make a decision about whether to buy or sell Microsoft. And buying or selling Microsoft, you might gain or lose $20, but it takes you an hour and a half to figure it out because you have to go on the Wall Street Journal, you have to go on E-Trade and make the transaction. There are various costs involved in terms of your time. If you earn $20 an hour and your leisure is worth your wage rate and it takes you an hour and a half, that's an expected cost of $30. That's the expected value of $20. $30 is more than $20 and a rational person, of course, you know, it's hard to know these numbers in advance, but if this is all noble, you would not bother to even find out that information. You would just stay at your desk, work an extra hour and a half, and come what may of the stock. It doesn't matter. Even if it lost $20, you made the right choice because you earned 30 by not spending your time and effort learning about that situation. So this is called rational apathy, and it affects small shareholders more than large ones because the small shareholders have less to gain from information about a particular transaction. And so this will tie into our conversation about institutional investors. The second collective action problem is called free riding. And free riding is when one person will wait for another person to make a decision and then just follow along. So, you know, if, if, uh, if it costs me a certain amount of time and effort, costs everyone the time and effort, instead of spending that time and effort, maybe I can just see what Mary Beth does and assume that Mary Beth made the right choice because she invested the time and effort. It's more likely that I will follow someone, that I will free ride on someone when that other person has a larger interest, a larger stake, because I have more reason to believe they're spending the effort. If they did the same calculation I did, right? I did the calculation, it, it would take me $30 to, spend, to, to figure out whether to buy or sell. I could earn $20 if I make the right choice, I don't do it. But maybe there's somebody else out there that has a million shares of stock, and they may gain or lose $20 million. So I would assume this person is going to buy or sell the stock based on uh, a substantial amount of effort to collect that information. So I'll just do whatever that person did and free ride on their effort, because they have a bigger incentive to actually find out the truth and the information. Now, there's some problems with free riding, of course. One is that, let's say we're all invested the same amount, it may not be worthwhile for any of us to spend our time and effort in learning whether or not the stock should be bought or sold. And so, if there is enough free riding, nobody will take any action. 
The other issue is that, you know, if Alexander spends the time and effort doing this and I free ride off him, he has just created a positive externality, meaning he gets some of the gains from making the right choice, but other people get some of that gain too. If I buy the stock at the same time, maybe the stock doesn't go, uh, you know, goes up in value or I sell it, you know, if I sell it before him, I might capture some of the difference in stock value. So you don't get the full benefits of your effort. So free riding, you can almost think of it as dragging you down because people are free riding off of your effort. That effort is less valuable to you. The benefits are externalized more generally to society. And so you're less likely to do it than if people were not free riding on your effort. And finally, this creates a problem of perceived unfairness because there's a person out there who's literally being dragged down by all these free riders who would otherwise not necessarily trade. And this person becomes a de facto sort of guardian of all the other shareholders. And this is uh, sometimes not only is fundamentally unfair, but puts the guardian in a certain position where they could take advantage. If you know that everyone else is trading off of your information, if other people believe that uh, Alex has got the real insight because he spent the time and effort. It's possible that Alex could manipulate the rest of us into trading in a way that benefits him to capture, basically to recapture those positive externalities that you had lost the value of and instead you turn them into negative externalities by acting in ways which will distort uh, the market. So I think the best source for this, for those of you who want to pursue it and learn more, is to read uh, The Logic of Collective Action by Mankur Olson. Uh, but it, it effectively presents this and many other, other problems that are uh, an issue when dealing with stock trading today. But these pertain specifically to trading regarding retail investors. Once we move into an institutional world, things do seem to change to a certain extent. John Coffey and Darius Palia wrote The Wolf at the Door, the impact of hedge fund activism on corporate governance. And they made the suggestion that uh, shareholder activism is changing because the nature of shareholders is changing. And instead of a world where most are small shareholders that only have a few shares and have a lot of these collective action problems, there are more and more companies owned by large conglomerates, blocks of corporations that have huge amount of shares and don't suffer from these collective action problems in the same way. To put it another way, shareholder dispersion, the smallness of individual shareholders, many, many, many small shareholders makes shareholder activism more costly, and the inverse, shareholder consolidation or institutional shareholders makes shareholder activism less costly. I mean, in addition to the problems I described about obtaining information, if you want to convince other people to vote alongside of you, and you have to physically send them an envelope in the mail, each stamp costs, well, they just went up, right? Let's say 50 cents. It actually literally costs money for a stamp. If you have to send a piece of mail to a million people, that's $500,000 worth of stamps. If you only have to pick up the phone and call 20 people, because that's all it takes to vote management out of office, that's a fundamentally cheaper proposition. And people don't read their mail, it's expensive to do. And so if you have access to reach people using new media as well, like if you can reach the key investors, the large stakeholders using Twitter, you can do this instantaneously for free with live feedback. This is a different world than when you have to send everything to the SEC, have it registered, approved, get the reference that you can mail things out and then send communications via snail mail. Fundamentally different process, fundamentally different costs. Um, and anyway, back to the coffee argument, uh, concentration, concentrated ownership makes shareholder activism rational from a cost-benefit perspective, where it was irrational or where apathy was rational before, activism is now rational. And therefore, activism we would expect to increase, and moreover, he did show empirically it has increased over time. My small contribution to this field uh, in, in how, uh, how Twitter is disrupting shareholder activism is suggesting, as I alluded to, that the use of social media and new media has also made it cheaper for investors to act collectively. Basically, the information costs are lower than they used to be because you can just go on Twitter and get a stream from people that you trust. You don't have to read the analyst reports. Maybe you should, but a lot of people get their information based on what is the consensus among their cadre. And 
Uh, in addition, you can reach people much more easily. So if you have a message to say, you just say it. You have enough followers, or if it gets retweeted, that message becomes uh, uh, well known, and, and so you can convince people to take certain actions, like to buy or sell a stock, based on it. And so uh, I believe that new media will continue to reduce some of the costs of information and the costs of collectively organizing, which we would expect to see more shareholder activism for that reason as well. That's the theory. Let's talk a little bit about the substance. When you have a proxy contest, you literally mail out, at the end of the day, you still have to mail out physical cards that people, sometimes, I'm saying like 10% of people, fill in and return. On the screen you have one from Apple's most recent meeting. Now, keep in mind that most of these uh, proxies are, un are not contested. Basically, the company sends out a card, asks you to vote, and send it back. And what happens to that card? It basically goes uh, to an appointed individual who will vote on your behalf at the annual meeting of stockholders. So kind of one thing to remember then from right, way back last semester is that corporations have an annual meeting of stockholders at which they elect the directors. Usually they elect all the directors, but sometimes they have what are called staggered boards or classified boards where you elect uh, a third of the directors each of three years, and so it takes three years to replace the entire management. But the fundamental purpose of the shareholder meeting is to inform the shareholders. Uh, sometimes it's to go to Cabo and have a, have a party, and then to vote for the directors and to, to elect the directors. Usually it's uncontested, and so you just fill in your card and send it back. Uh, and, uh, and, and there you go, but sometimes there are two different cards. A red card for one slate of directors, a blue card for another. A red card that management sends out and says vote the red card on behalf of management, keep management intact. A blue card sent out by an activist. And now we start to see, think about all these cards, think about all these mailings, think about all this compliance. The activist has to pay for that. The activist is paying for all of these proxy solicitations to actually print, send these cards, get them registered with the SEC, have an appointed agent to collect and, and vote them. Uh, so that leads us, actually before I leave, that, that will lead us to reimbursement of these expenses, because as you can imagine, it's expensive to do this, but one thing that's notable, it's hard to see on the screen, but it actually has here proposals, and there will be a set of shareholder proposals. We're gonna to come to that at the end of this lecture. We talk about Rule 14A8, and precatory proposals basically saying, hey shareholders, do you think that uh, Cracker Barrel should stop firing gay people for being gay? Check yes or no. And you can actually check yes or no and vote for that. The question more fundamentally is, does it even go on the card? Because as we'll see with the Cracker Barrel case, that kind of thing is contested very, very hotly, right? I mean, if a company does have a policy of firing gay people for being gay, just the fact of that being printed and mailed, regardless of how the vote comes out, is a PR disaster. A horrible thing for a company to be doing and for that to be cast in the public eye in a major way. So what goes on the card? Well, the shareholders have some rights to put certain things on the card. We'll see with the Cracker Bell case, that's exactly what they tried to put on. And we're gonna use that as a tool to learn about whether those proposals have to go on or can be excluded. Turns out, oddly, that uh, in one year it was, it was excluded and subsequently was, was included and gives you kind of an example about how shareholders are using these proxy cards to make big policy statements and drive policy change. Um, all right, so reimbursement of expenses. So this is the case of, uh, of Republic, uh, Fairchild Republic, a uh, notable company for making the, uh, one of the ugliest airplanes in military service, the A-10 Warthog. Um, it's kind of like, actually kind of cute in an ugly way. I don't know, I kind of like it. But, but in any event, uh, this case is mostly about reimbursement of expenses. And so in this particular case, we have insurgents that won a proxy contest. And after they won the proxy contest, by the way, it cost them a lot of money. Uh, I, I guess they, they spent $127,000 to win this contest. And, uh, and after they won, they wanted to pay themselves back. And in fact, they did a solid for the directors. The directors had spent money for the contest, and they actually reimbursed the losing directors as well. And so we have a relatively straightforward rule uh, about whether or not uh, reimbursement is possible, and the answer is quite simple. A winner can get their expenses reimbursed. So if the incumbent wins, they can get their expenses reimbursed. And so that is the reimbursement rule. A victorious incumbent 
can get repaid, and apparently can also pay losing, ma losing management, uh, sorry, an insurgent, a, a, a victorious insurgent can uh, be compensated, can, can be reimbursed, and they, in this case, repaid the uh, losing incumbent, and that seemed to prevail as well. Question. So just to be clear, if there is an insurgent, are they responsible for all of the um, expenses or just for their portion of it, just for their blue cards? Or are they so responsible for the whole price? They're, they're responsible for their side of the expenses, their blue cards, mm -hmm. and then if they win, they can ask the company to pay them mm -hmm. back okay. for those expenses. Yeah, so they won't, so the, I, I think to your broader question is sort of like, this whole thing might cost $300,000 because the company is mailing a lot of stuff. No, the company pays for its own mailings, and then on top of that, the shareholders will pay for SEC filings, for lawyers to represent them vis-a-vis -vis the SEC, for the physical mailings, for other administrative matters, other advertisements that they may place, and they will then seek reimbursement for that, which they can get if they win. So that's the reimbursement rule. Perhaps more interesting than the reimbursement rule is what is a proxy solicitation? And here we have our first SEC rule for the semester, SEC rule 14A-1. 14A-1 requires companies to file a form, guess what, 14. It's one thing that's helpful about these. The form numbers as well as the regulation are often similar. It's actually, I'll get more complicated, it's actually a, a, a DEF or a definitive 14A and there's more complexity as well because actually you first file a preliminary and then there's often a DEFN and a DEFA for amended. Okay, all you need to know for my purposes is it's Rule 14, Form 14. Okay, and so under Rule 14A, they have to file uh, Form 14A, which says we're going to solicit proxies. It's effectively a notification with the SEC that we're going to ask people to vote the blue card. And when do we have to file this document? When we are soliciting proxies. Now, we need a definition. The rule does define it, although it doesn't define it all that well because we have reasonable thrown in there. The definition is any request for a proxy, whether or not accompanied by or included in a form of proxy. Okay, so any request for a proxy, whether or not a proxy form is sent with it. Any request to exclude or not to exclude or revoke a proxy. So any request to the company to change effectively anything regarding their proxy statement or the furnishing of a proxy form. If you send someone a blue card, and whether or not you said vote the blue card, so if you say, hey, vote the blue card, we're gonna send it later, that's a solicitation. If you say, hey, company, we want you to add a precatory proposal, that's a solicitation. And if you send the blue card with no instructions, that's a solicitation. All of those require a filing that you intend to solicit proxies. The key thing is going to be whether or not what you send is reasonably calculated, reasonably calculated to result in the procurement, withholding, or revocation, or proxy. Is it reasonably calculated that what you do will encourage somebody to act on this proxy in a particular way? Our case for that is going to be Lilco, or Long Island Lighting Company versus Barbrash. And in this case, we had a particular newspaper ad. Do I have it on this screen here? So we have a newspaper advertisement published. I have it on the screen here on the right side. It says replace loco. There's an alternative. We want to get rid of management. Now, it doesn't say vote the blue card. It doesn't say vote the blue card. It simply is an advertisement in a newspaper, a general solicitation to get rid of Lilco management. And as some of the class mentioned, there was a lot of political upheaval around this case uh, as well, this had to do with the decision to rebuild a nuclear, hur a nuclear power plant after a hurricane. So it's fairly contentious. These things always have a backstory like that. I mean, sometimes they're just about money, but in this case, it's about avoiding a nuclear disaster. So people get a little more excited about that sometimes. So the special interest group runs the ad, and the court holds that this counts as a solicitation. 
Right? A proxy solicitation can include communications just like this one. This, in fact, is a solicitation. Uh, a proxy solicitation may include communications a clearing, a, a appearing in publications of general solicitation that are indirectly addressed to shareholders. So, bottom line, newspaper advertisements saying replace management when there's a proxy contest going on, that counts as a solicitation and may incur a requirement to file form 14A uh, uh, in compliance with Rule 14A1. Yes? What is the sort of sanction for doing that without the SEC's approval? I, I don't know offhand. Uh, what is the sanction for, for not filing the form? Um, you know, I don't know offhand. I'm, I, I, I'm sure there are fines involved with this, but there might be other penalties, like that you can't vote that proxy or it precludes you from the process, because the, the SEC is also going to be sort of policing and making sure the process is fair. So it's a good question. I don't know offhand what are the penalties for noncompliance of failure to file a 14A. But generally, the SEC comes down pretty hard on these kind of things. So my general reaction would be I'd expect some serious fines and maybe uh, prohibiting someone from participating in that, in that particular election on that basis. So since proxies can be expensive, and by the way, there's going to be a theme that runs through a lot of this class in my work, is when, you, when the regulation is expensive, you look for an exemption. You try not to comply, right? That's the, that's, the, that's the goal, is how do you get outside of the regulation? And there are ways to be exempt from proxy regulations, and it's not clear whether or not Twitter is going to fall under this as well. So, for example, I have on the board a tweet by Carl Icahn. Carl Icahn is a notable activist shareholder. He owns large quantities uh, of stock in, a, in a very, various industries, has for a long time pushed management to change, is kind of one of these quote-unquote value investors. And um, he tweeted this. We currently have a large position in Apple. We believe the company to be extremely undervalued. Spoke to Tim Cook today. More to come. Now, I think this is an open door as to, is this fundamentally different than this? Now, it is different in terms of it being in print versus being electronic. And it is a little different. This expressly says change management. This says we're talking to management. Maybe there are some aspects along the margins. But I want you just to understand the similarities here. Now, this was ruled to fall within an exemption. And there were no fines attached, at least to my knowledge, for the filing of this particular document. That exemption, by the way, is under 14A2, uh, solicitations by uh, shareholders who do not seek proxy authority and do not furnish proxies. Sort of the inverse of 14A1 and 14A2, there is no proxy attached. Um, but in addition, it raised the question of whether Twitter is speeches in the public forum. The SEC seems to hold the position that Twitter is not speech in the public forum. I disagree. but still kind of unresolved, and, and what exactly constitutes a speech in the public forum seems to be an evolving topic. So that gets us through proxy proposals, but, you know, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of, a lot, well, I, I should actually also mention that a lot of the reason people engage in this is not to win the proxy contest, but just to force management to change, because they don't want the fight either. Hopefully they just roll over, which happens uh, pretty often, as they get some kind of settlement. And instead of replacing the board, they get one seat on the board, or they agree to sell off some type of underperforming um, subsidiary or something like that. But sometimes shareholders are also in the business of making proposals not to maximize shareholder value, not to unlock value, and not to inherently to change management, but to make some kind of policy statement and to try to influence the way the company does business for reasons that I think we can understand roughly as a type of corporate social responsibility. And there's a fundamental problem with these because, as we discussed, the board and not the shareholders run the company. There are theorists, as we talked about last week, who believe that the shareholders should have more power. But in general, the contract between shareholders and management is that the shareholders, while being owners of the company, have devolved management authority to the directors and the officers, the directors in particular, who, by virtue of uh, board action, will determine the course of the company, including how it stands on certain policy issues. And so whether Hobby Lobby provides contraceptives, that's a board decision. Whether Cracker Barrel hires homosexual employees, that's a board decision, or is it? 
And so that's really what this gets to. And we're going to see a couple interesting cases. There are some uh, rules just to put out there. Uh, this is all under Rule 14A8. So we're still under 14A is all about the proxy stuff. 14A1 is what constitutes a solicitation. And 14A8, particularly 14A8I, talks about uh, uh, when a shareholder can make a proposal that also gets put on that nice little uh, form there. And, uh, and the company, of course, is going to try, if they don't want this information to go out there, to exclude it. The formal requirements are pretty straightforward, but they're important to keep in mind. Lawyers should always have some concept of the formal requirements. And so to be eligible for a proposal, the proponent has to own stock. How much stock? They have to have either 1% of the overall outstanding stock, which can often be a lot, or $2,000 worth of stock, which is usually a lot less. I mean, it depends on the size of the company. There are not a lot of public companies of interest where 1% is less than $2,000 in value. But, uh, so the, the lower threshold is $2,000 worth of the company's stock, and they have to hold that stock for a year. So you can't just buy the stock and solicit uh, or submit a, a proposal for a practical proposal the next day. The second is the proposal may not exceed 500 words. It's kind of like a big tweet, I guess. So you have to have relatively short proposals, and there's timeliness. The proposal has to be submitted uh, not less than 120 days before the proxy statement. And so you have some, some timing requirements as well. Um, so you can just look at those. It's all in 14A8. That's the easy stuff. The harder stuff is to really understand the basis for exclusion of these proposals. Now, one of the bases is that it doesn't meet the formal requirements, but it's pretty easy to meet these requirements. I mean, if, you don't, if you're not a shareholder, you're not a shareholder, but you, know, you convince someone to submit it on your behalf. But even if these are met, there's a process by which a company can refuse to uh, publish these proposals. And like I mentioned in the, in the example that we'll come back to on Cracker Barrel, there are good reasons that a company, for, for business reasons at least, I shouldn't say good reasons, but for business reasons, you can understand why a company would not want to have a whole debate and discussion about their hiring practices regarding uh, gay and lesbian employees. It's, it's not a very uh, popular discussion and it's you know problematic enough that those practices are going on. Worse yet for them to be the focus of the annual uh, meeting. So, we can look at Rule 14A8I, which specifies 13 discrete reasons for exclusion of a proposal. And um, you, you can look at these in more detail. We're going to focus on just one of them, uh, but all we could spend quite a, num quite a number of hours sorting through all the details of all these. We're going to focus on the management function one, because that's where some of the real action has been. But just to go over them briefly so you have them in your mind, a proposal can be excluded because it's improper under state law. So all those as a federal system, there may also be state law which is implicated. A proposal which suggests the company violate the law is excludable. So I could have a proposal to Anheuser-Busch saying, let's sell beer to nine-year-olds. Okay, that's going to get kicked out pretty easily. It's illegal to sell beer to nine-year-olds. And so we can exclude that based on violation of law. It might violate the proxy rules, such as the ones I just mentioned, that you have to be a shareholder of, uh, of record for a year, who has at least $2,000 of value. It cannot relate to a personal grievance. And so uh, you know, I'm mad at Wells Fargo because I paid $340 in fees last year on my corporate bank account. And so I'm going to have a proposal that says, uh, uh, Wells Fargo directors are a bunch of jerks. OK, well, that's kind of a personal grievance. And so we're going to exclude that uh, from the proposal. It has to be relevant to the company's business, which is challenging because it also cannot, as we'll see, implicate a management function. Um, if the company does not have the power to effectuate the proposal, it can be excluded for that reason. Right? So let's say that the company, again, it's Anheuser-Busch. The proposal is, let's send someone to Mars. OK, well, Anheuser-Busch doesn't generally send people into space at all. Uh, and so they might not have the authority or power to do that. The management function will come back to, if it pertains to director elections, that's not a proper proposal. You should instead propose a separate slate of directors. Uh, another way the company can play games with this is a shareholder proposal cannot conflict with a company proposal, and so the company can potentially stick their own proposal in there, which is on similar subject matter, and thereby exclude a shareholder's proposal. 
Um, likewise, or similarly, if the proposal's already been implemented, you know, like let's say that someone says that uh, uh, Anheuser-Busch should sponsor more advertisements against drunk driving. All right, well, they already have a lot of advertisements of, against drunk driving, so that proposal could be excluded as well. Uh, it might be duplicative. Uh, there are some limits on how many times you could resubmit a proposal. You submit a proposal, it fails. There are some rules that pertain to resubmission, but it's not unlimited. And finally, asking for a dividend. That's a board discretion, and so a shareholder, although they're entitled to dividends if issued under certain cases, they cannot demand a dividend. And so those are our 13 grounds for exclusion, but we're going to focus on the ordinary business exception because it gives us three nice cases to talk about which add a little color to otherwise a relatively uh, uh, black and white rule. As I mentioned, this is all 14A8I, and this is in particular 14A8I7. 14A8I7 uh, says that a proposal that relates to management function uh, can be excluded. This is also known as the ordinary business exception. And so the question then is, what does pertain to ordinary business? And so one case we have is SEC versus Medical Committee for Human Rights. And so at this time, this is in the 70s or late 60s, Vietnam era, Dow Chemical Company was producing napalm. Now napalm is nasty stuff. You detonate it over villages, over areas where there's tree cover, it causes burns, it causes all kinds of, uh, uh, of birth defects and deformities. Uh, it's, a, it's questionable whether it's, I mean, I'm, there's not a course on international laws of war, but the use of napalm certainly raises some, some questions about that. Um, and in any event, uh, the, the Vietnam War rankled a lot of people for a number of reasons anyway. And so the Dow Chemical, Com Chemical Company was, was making uh, napalm, and a shareholder uh, submitted a proposal that said, basically, Dow Chemical should stop selling napalm. And the company sought to exclude this, saying that sales of napalm are part of our ordinary business. We're a chemical company. Napalm's a chemical. And as a result, uh, we're going to seek to exclude this proposal. Now, the way that the SEC operates with this is you effectively ask the SEC for what's called a no-action letter, asking the SEC to say, look, if we exclude this proposal, are you going to come after us? And the SEC will not say the proposal is permitted, will not say the exclusion is permitted, but it will say that we're not going to come after you. Now they're going to try to limit that, and they make claims that this no-action letter pertains only to that one company and not generally. Whether or not that's regarded or disregarded is another question as well. But uh, uh, in any event, they got their no-action letter and supported exclusion. However, the Court of Appeals overturned it and said, look, napalm reflects a tiny amount of the sales of Dow Chemical. This is not a huge part of the business. And uh, it also has major policy implications. And so we see that there are some questions here about whether something like the sale of napalm really relates to the ordinary business or not. Um, but the fact that the SEC went one way and an appellate court went another way is certainly insightful and interesting, showing that this is a case that was close to the line. Another case that was close to the line involved cracker barrels I alluded to. A shareholder submitted a proposal saying that, that um, Cracker Barrel has a policy of firing gay employees, and they need to stop that policy. They need to stop firing employees who come out of the closet as gay. By the way, the year is 1992. It's kind of amazing that this, this was, I mean, 92 doesn't sound that long ago, but you know, where, where the nation was in terms of, of gay rights and, and you know, equal access was, was fundamentally different. So that's kind of part of the mindset here. And um, the question was, is workplace discrimination ordinary business. And at first, in 1992, the SEC said it was. This is a matter of workplace discrimination. And whether or not we have a policy that prevents workplace discrimination, that's ordinary business. Hiring and firing of employees is ordinary business. And so in 1992, the proposal was excluded. But in 1998, the New York City Comptroller, that's who submitted the first time, submitted the proposal again. And actually, the SEC interestingly changed its position and said that 
the decision to fire gay employees was not an ordinary business decision. It rather did relate to larger areas of policy. It was not effectively a board decision to make. It reflected the general interests of the company in a larger way and required the inclusion of that proposal, which was actually, um, these proposals usually fail. I mean, proposals in general fail. This one passed with a 58% uh, to a uh, 58% uh, approval on the proposal for Cracker Bell to stop this practice. Question? The New York City Comptroller, did he submit this proposal as a shareholder? Yes, the New York City Comptroller, yeah, that's my, yeah. In his official capacity? Official capacity, yeah. How does that work? The New York City must have owned stock in Cracker Barrel, yeah, okay. probably through a pension fund. They probably owned it for like you know New York teachers or New York policemen or New York fire, and, they, and the comptroller is going to manage the pension funds and be essentially the record holder of, of that. And so they would have owned some some group of stock, including including this one. Yeah, yeah, and interesting to see a state getting involved at this level as well. Did that have some influence on the SEC and the appellate decision? I don't know, but I think it's interesting to see how the world had changed between 92 and 98 uh, regarding this proposal. Sort of an interesting kind of glimpse in the history. And so <clears throat> to round out our discussion, then shareholder activism uh, relates to collective action problems because individuals are simply not going to spend their time and effort engaging in these kind of activities when they don't pay off. But institutional investors might because they don't suffer the same type of costs and they may have better access to information and they certainly have more invested in these particular companies. And so the rise of institutional investors seems to be changing the face of shareholder activism, as does social media. And as we have new ways of communicating that lowers various costs in terms of motivating people to organize and acquiring information, this means that we would expect to see more proxy contests, more challenges for board seats, uh, which involve, first and foremost, a solicitation, which has to go through Rule 14A1. And any solicitation uh, needs to file a Form 14A. It's technically a DEF 14A. But again, there's some complexities there because there is a preliminary and amended. Just remember Form 14A for Rule 14A. And you remember what form is necessary for that particular action. Uh, uh, that may include newspaper advertisements, does not appear to include tweets, but we saw at least one newspaper advertisement and a tweet that was close to the line where maybe that was a solicitation for proxies requiring filing a form 14A, DEF 14A. Winner of a contest can potentially get reimbursed and shareholders make proposals which have 13 grounds for exclusion. And so that rounds out our conversation on shareholder activism. Any questions?